uh, concussions are a very large problem uh, in sporting goods. You know, 3.8 million concussions in football. We've been working on this project. This project has been going on for almost 10 years. Why doesn't a woodpecker get a concussion? And it was that, that little seed of thought that led to Dr. Dave basically spending a year of his life and immersing himself in the physiology of the woodpecker. And you know, the woodpecker specifically, you know, slams its head into a tree, 120 Gs, 80, 80 million times in its life, and doesn't seem to have any brain injury. And uh, it's not just because it doesn't play football. It also has some special protective mechanisms that it deals with. Every time the woodpecker goes to hammer its head into, the, into a tree, that omohyoid muscle provides mild constriction of the jugular vein. By restricting the outflow of blood, that fills up the extra little cavities and sinuses and small spaces in the brain just enough that it can reduce the brain's movement inside the skull. But what if we do the same thing that the uh, woodpecker does, right? What if we manually constrict that jugular vein? What if we're able to fill up the compliant volume, the sinuses and extra cavities, small vessels, things like that, fill it up just a little bit more? Would we be able to reduce the sloshing of the brain inside the skull and would we prevent brain injury? It was a very exciting uh, 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 theory at the time. A lot of solutions have been proposed for how to do this. A lot of helmet-based solutions, uh, a lot of other things. And what's fascinating about this project is the clinical data showing that we might actually be protecting the brain. Uh, no one's ever developed a neck wearable jugular restriction device. Uh, it just doesn't exist and it certainly doesn't exist in the sporting goods application. So we outfitted an entire team with collars and a control group did not have the collars. All the kids from both teams um, I had accelerometers in their helmet, and again, preseason and postseason scans of MRI, fMRI, DTI, uh, and other related um, neurological indicators. Right after an entire season of play, uh, we, we compared the hit data between both. And on the left, you can see the hit uh, amplitude and frequency of the hits for the non-collared group versus the amplitude and frequency of the collared group. And you see they're pretty equal for the 40,000 hits that each team took over that time period. They're pretty equal. But what is amazing is that the group that did not wear the collar showed some changes to the brain structure as observed through MRI and through DTI specifically, whereas the group on the right, the collar group, did not show those changes. And so what this study showed is that there was a significant reduction to changes in the brain over the course of a single season. Uh, but for me, it's probably one of the most, if not the most significant thing I will have ever worked on is this. Um, I know that when uh, Julian talks about this project, you know, his goal is to save football. He loves football. He played football. His kids played football. He wants to save football. Uh, Greg is a huge uh, football fan, uh, highly involved, you know, with the Bengals and wants to save football. So everybody on this team likes the impact of what this collar might mean for sports, uh, you know, for keeping uh, youth active and for protecting the brain. It's actually very hard for me uh, to watch football, to watch hockey and not see a device on, on the neck. I mean, it's just a big open space that we could be using to, to protect people.